I'm Jean Witowski Wendy, and I'm Dean of the School of Public Health and Health Professions. And this is the 28th year that we have been doing the uh, J. Warren Perry Lecture, and I welcome you all today to join us. Uh, the School of Public Health and Health Professions has honored Dr. J. Warren Perry for many years. He was the initial, the inaugural dean of the School of Health-Related Professions at the University of Buffalo. Dr. Perry was a pioneer in the field of allied health and served as dean of our school from 1966 until his retirement in 1977. In 1989, the dean of the health-related professions, Alan Stull, initiated this lecture series, and it was done to honor Dr. Perry with an event which would reach out to the school alumni and expose our faculty and students to some of the best scholars in health sciences. In 2003, the university expanded our school and its focus became the School of Public Health and Health Professions, and we continue to honor Dr. Perry with this annual lecture. Today, uh, we have a very important speaker who's with us, Dr. Sandro Galeo. Dr. Galea is the Robert A. Knox Professor and Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. Prior to his appointment, Dr. Galea served as the Gelman Professor and Chair of the Department of Epidemiology at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. He previously held academic and leadership positions at the University of Michigan and the New York Academy of Medicine. Dr. Galea is a physician and an epidemiologist. He received a medical degree from the University of Toronto, a master's degree in public health from Harvard University, and a doctorate in public health in epidemiology from Columbia University. He is an honorary doctorate from the University of Glasgow. He was named one of Time Magazine's Epidemiology Innovators and has been listed by Thompson Reuters as one of the world's most influential scientific minds for his work in the social sciences. He is past president of the Society for Epidemiologic Research and an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and of the American Epidemiologic Society. Dr. Galea serves frequently on advisory groups to national and international organizations, including the New York City Department of Health. In his scholarship, Dr. Galea is centrally interested in the social production of health of urban populations with a focus on the causes of brain disorders, particularly common moon anxiety disorders and substance abuse. He has a long particular interest in the consequences of mass trauma and conflict worldwide, including but not limited to the results of the September 11 attacks, Hurricane Katrina, conflicts in sub-Saharan Africa, and the American wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. This work that he's done has been funded but principally by the National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and foundations. He has published over 600 scientific journal articles, 50 book chapters, 10 books, and his research has been featured extensively in current periodicals and newspapers. His latest book, co-authored with Catherine Re Keyes, Population Health Science, was published by Oxford University Press just this past year. He is a regular contributor to Fortune magazine and is published wild, widely in the lay press, including the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, the Boston Globe, and the New York Times. His research has been cited extensively. We are truly privileged to have Dr. Galea here as he discusses how we are all closer to gun violence and we are closer to this than what we perceive. It's such an honor to have Dr. Galea here today. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much. 
Can you hear me like this? In the back? Yes? Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, I'll, I'll try to... I will walk while I speak. Let me show you I can do this. Um, it, it's really... Uh, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here. It's a, it's a real uh, privilege to speak at the Perry Lecture, um, given the uh, distinguished uh, provenance of the lectureship and the people who have spoken before me. I was asked to talk about firearms, and um, I'm uh, using this uh, title about firearms and population health. It's a little bit more of a general title than uh, I realize the one that's on the poster, but roughly getting at the same thing. And uh, I will frame my comments this way. I, uh, as uh, you heard in the introduction, I have long been interested in trauma, and I've long seen trauma as a very interesting mechanism at the intersection between social, economic, political forces that shape population health and the health of populations. And w when one is interested about in trauma, it almost becomes inevitable in this country today that one gets an interested in firearms, and in firearms as one of these mechanisms through which we shape the health of populations. Now, in talking about firearms, one of the dangers is, or perhaps one of the things that's most interesting about it, is that it taps into strong, very strong, political, personal, cultural, social memes and beliefs about the place of firearms. And um, I, I will frame that my talk is not about that. And my talk is going to be about the data. And then I will present the data, and I, I welcome comments, debates, discussion afterwards, which then draw more on the broader social political context. But what I saw my role here is, is to say, amidst the noise on this issue, Let's just talk a little bit about what the numbers look like. Let's talk a little bit about the, what, what I'm calling here firearm, the firearm epidemic, and I'll discuss that in a second, what that really looks like and what is happening around this issue in this country. So by way, that's by way of framing. So let me now plunge in. So this is from uh, the book that we just published that uh, Jean mentioned about population health science. And I thought it was actually important to talk a little bit about what exactly do we mean by population health. So population health is requires us to assure the social, economic, cultural conditions for people to be healthy. And I think it's an important definition to start from because given where I come from, where you're all sitting, within institutions of higher education concerned with the health of the public, it's important to say what are our responsibilities within that remit. And I think our responsibilities are to tackle the social, economic, cultural conditions that ultimately shape the health of populations, even if those social, economic, cultural conditions make for uncomfortable situations and make us discuss topics that are tricky and perhaps controversial. Mm -hmm. Now I can't see you because the, you're, you're all like a strobe light. That's okay. Every once in a while say something so I know you're, you're all still there. Um, um, so I, I actually think it's important to start this way so that we recognize that the reason we're tackling this topic is to the end of saying how can we create healthier populations and from a sense of responsibility that culture, society, economics, politics are ultimately part of these drivers and that we cannot truly improve the health of populations without tackling these drivers. And I think the firearm epidemic very much falls in with that. This is, uh, from, uh, this is the Wall Street Journal. This is just a few days ago. This is November 1st, 2016. And uh, I'm just putting it up here um, uh, simply to make the point that this issue has never been hotter. I'm going to make the point that actually this issue has been equally hot, should have been equally hot, for the past 15 to 20 years. But it's only now that it's actually getting as much traction in the lay press. I feel like uh, it's an issue which I've cared about for a long time, people who study trauma have cared about for a long time, and that uh, it's only in the past couple of years that all of a sudden everybody's paying attention to it. Um, Chicago is a good example. With, uh, it, it has become part of the, of the national political conversation, with Chicago serving as a little bit of a political football with different sides um, using the example of Chicago to its own ends. And I'm happy to talk about Chicago afterwards, um, but suffice to say that in many respects, Chicago is an exception to what's really going on in much of the country. So this is, uh, this is the only table I'm going to show you, but uh, I will explain why I'm showing you this. This is a paper that just came out a couple of days ago that asks the simple question, this from our group, that said, what percent of Americans in their lifetime will know somebody who has been shot by a gun? 
And uh, when we actually did this analysis, we were surprised, and at the end of the day, the, the answer is actually roughly in this column, is that broadly speaking, between 90 to 99 percent of Americans during their lifetime will know someone who has been shot by a gun. And I found in conversation with people that uh, there are sort of two kinds of people. First of all, oh yeah, yeah, I know somebody's been shot by a gun, or else somebody said, no, no, I don't. And then, oh, wait a second, actually I do. And uh, the reason we did this analysis is because we're trying to ask ourselves, is this issue of guns an issue of the other? Because typically I find myself in rooms like this, talking to people like you, who are broadly speaking privileged within society, who are not going through their day-to-day -day being afraid of being shot. And is this therefore an issue of people out there, people outside these doors, or is this an issue that affects all of us? And what we found is that in fact, nearly all of us know somebody who has been shot by a gun. In fact, our research team went through the same thing. Like, oh, no, actually, I don't think I do. Oh, well, actually, when I think about it, yes, in fact, I do. And I'll let you all think about that for yourselves. So the first point is, this is not something that happens just to the other. It's something that happens to all of us. So now, let's talk about some numbers. So I'm using the word epidemic. And for those of you who are in epidemiology, you may quibble with me about whether or not this is an epidemic. But uh, in many respects, I actually am not sure it's an epidemic because epidemic, by definition, is something that's happening at a rate over its baseline. As I'm going to show you in a second, our rate of gun injury, and I'm using the word injury intentionally, in this country has been stable, in fact, for many decades. It's certainly epidemic, or at least it's endemic. It actually would be worse if we think of it as endemic because then it means that we're accepting that this baseline rate of, of gun-related injury is normative in this country. So let's start with data. But before we start with data, I want to start with people. So these are the 49 people who were killed in the largest single gun-related incident in this country, in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. And I'm starting with people because at the end of the day, when we're talking about populations, we are talking about people. These are people who are actually are injured by a gun some of whom die, and some of whom, as I'm going to talk about in a second, do not die. But I just wanted to put up people's names on the screen, because I think in this conversation, we frequently forget that the consequences of guns are that people like all of us, are, who are getting on with their day, living their life, in one instant, stop living that life completely unexpectedly. These are the 49 people who died in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. Now, this was a mass shooting that got a tremendous amount of attention. You'll all remember it became, in some respects, a beacon for anger on this issue. And then what happened with this event, as happens with all other mass shootings, is after a week of outcry, we went back to business as usual. So after this, what was business as usual? Were we done with mass shootings in this country? What happened in the month after the Pulse nightclub? Well, here's what happened. These were all the mass shootings in the month after Orlando. The red are people who were killed, and the amber are people who were injured. And they were in places from Minnesota to Florida, Indianapolis, Indianapolis Illinois, New Jersey, California, Tennessee, Alabama, South Carolina, etc., etc. So this was in the month after the Orlando shooting. So the reason I'm showing you this is because our, our intersection with the issue of firearms is episodic at best. And in fact, our intersection with the broader issue of trauma is always episodic. It's, it's like we, we tend to keep thinking of trauma as something that happens to the other, which is why I showed you the first slide where I led off with, this, with the study that says, in fact, we all know people who have been affected by firearms, like we all know people have been affected by trauma. Most data shows that 90% of us will personally experience a traumatic event in our life, let alone most of us knowing someone who's been injured by a gun in their life. So these events are happening all the time. And I think the reason they're so easy for us to forget is because we sort of don't know when the next one will happen or where. But the thing that we do know is that there will be a next one. We just, don't know, we just don't know when or where and who it will affect. But our notion that we are somehow immune 
because it happens to others is actually false. Traumatic events happen to all of us and people in our social networks are all experiencing firearm violence at some point in our life. So this is just data. This is from the National, uh, National Firearm Deaths 1981 to 2014. So what I want to show you here is a couple of things. First of all, that, um, and, and, and I will several times in my talk make reference to the sort of political football this issue has become. So you take one side of the political argument to say gun deaths are lower than they were in the 80s. True. Gun deaths haven't changed one bit since 1999. Also true, right? They're both true. So in the 80s and 90s, when there was a an epidemic of homicide in this country, which most scholars now think is largely due to the explosion of much more readily accessible drugs, particularly crack cocaine. There was a much higher homicide rate, and we had a much higher um, uh, firearm death rate. You see it here? Went down in the 90s, precipitous decrease in the 90s, see it? Until 1998, 99. Since then, we have had consistently the same uh, firearm death rate in this country. So it's 1999, that's 17 years ago. So remember when I said at the beginning, is this an epidemic? Well, if epidemic means higher than baseline, well, I guess it's not. If endemic means a baseline that we've come to accept, it is. So nothing really has changed for the past 17 years. Now, for those who have been following the public and political discussion, it almost feels like the past two years have seen an explosion of firearm deaths, right? No, it's actually been roughly the same. We have been paying more and more attention. So depending on whether you're an optimist, which says, finally, we're paying attention to a real public health concern, or a pessimist to say, what took us so long? Nonetheless, we're here. We are now paying attention to this issue. As many of you here know, one of the challenges with studying this issue has been that there has been for a long time a restriction on funds through most, but not all, agencies that typically fund research to study firearm research. And that, in some respects, has stymied the generation of scholarship that infiltrates the public space and that generates public discussions. But we've had roughly the same people who've been dying from guns for the past now 17 years. It is not true that the states have been all the same during this time. In fact, different states have seen increases and different states have seen decreases in number of firearm-related injuries or deaths. So I want to show you this map because I want to, and right after the previous slide, because this is a very important point. Because as I'm going to come to at the end, the action on efforts to mitigate the consequences of the firearm epidemic has all been at the state level. And in no small part as a consequence of that, we have seen heterogeneity at the state level. The red states here are states where there's been an increase in firearm injury, and the blue states are states where there has been a decrease in firearm injury. That's how to read it, okay? So there has been a decrease in, sev in several states. There has been an increase in several states by fairly large gaps, by fairly large gaps. Um, um, roughly, you have about a four- to five-fold change in either increase or decrease. And obviously, we could talk about each state, but we won't do that because that will take a very long time. But message A, overall, we've been stable in firearm injury for about 17 years. Message B, we've been stable overall, but we have decreases and increases in different states. One very important element of firearm injury in this country is that there has been a pronounced differential by race. And this has, in many ways, colored a lot of the discussion. So this is, so you see there are three lines here. White is blue, other race is green, and black is uh, red. Okay. You see all three lines are roughly flat. There's a little bit of a decrease um, uh, in black, although none of the trends are actually significant except for the other. Uh, which is consistent with the fact that overall we've stayed flat, right? But you have about a two, a little bit more than a two-fold higher prevalence of firearm deaths in blacks compared to whites compared to other race. So this is an issue that has consistently, not increasingly, but consistently over more than a decade affected 
uh, racial minority groups in this country, particularly black racial minorities. Now, given this consistency over the past 17 years, you'll say, okay, well, what's up? Like, wh why are we paying attention now? Like, why is it that all of a sudden in the past couple of years, it seems like we're actually paying more attention? Because you're showing us data that says roughly the same number of people are dying, right? The reason we're paying more attention is because of this. So this is active shooter incidents um, between 2000 and 2013. So this is number of active shooter incidents, which has increased, and as you see, um, 2023, I mean, it's, a, it's an up and down, but broadly, there's an increasing trend. So we are now seeing more and more active shooter incidents, which of course has resulted, I don't know how many of you here have, uh, have school-aged children, but you'll know that of course that it now has resulted in active shooter drills in our schools, which is in many ways reflect exactly what we used to do with uh, nuclear threat drills in the, in, the, in the 50s and 60s that now our children in school, we have now accepted this as the new normal where kids are taught what to do if there is an active shooter. And I label that because there are implications of this for how we want to live. Do we want to live in a society where our children have active shooter drills in their schools where they are told to then lock themselves up in the closet in the classroom? And that's what kids are told. And it's, it's in, in some respects, not an irrational response to this. So this is what has been driving the increased interest. But the important thing to remember is that this is less than 2% of annual gun deaths, right? So our attention, for better or for worse, has been galvanized by the Newtowns and the Orlandos. And these are terrible moments. And they're catalyzing and galvanizing as they should be. But from the point of view of understanding populations and understanding the burden of firearms on the health of populations, they're actually a very, very small proportion. Now, I'm a pragmatist, and insofar as if these events can serve to galvanize our attention so that we can seriously tackle this issue together, then one can hope that there is a positive that can emerge from these terrible events. And, and, and when I'm speaking, I'm trying to choose my words very carefully to be value neutral about which direction we should take and what we should do as a society. And I'm going to leave that to the discussion. But I'm simply trying to point out that from point of view of those of us who are interested in promoting the health of the public, recognizing that there is something here that has a significant impact on, on the health of the public, we simply cannot ignore it. One of the data points that gets a fair bit of attention rightly so, is this. So this is gun deaths and motor vehicle deaths in this country. And I'll come back to motor vehicle deaths uh, closer towards, towards the end. But uh, what you see here is that uh, this is the purple is the same curve I showed you before. You see it, how it went up in the 80s and 90s. Then plateaued, has been the same since 99. That's exactly what I showed you before. But this is motor vehicle deaths, which have been going down essentially as a straight line. And uh, number of deaths from guns have exceeded number of deaths from motor vehicles uh, since about 2012, depending on, uh, on where you're counting. So we have made a dramatic change in number of deaths from motor vehicles, while we have been roughly the same, see motor vehicles, from guns for the past, just look at, just look at the past 15 years, right? Dramatic drop in motor vehicles, roughly the same in guns. Now, why am I pointing this out? I'm pointing this out for two reasons. Number one is part of the conversation on guns is typically that, uh, well, guns are part of the American culture. Accepting that as it is, it's, per it's hard to have a conversation that also doesn't accept that cars are part of American culture, right? Guns are ubiquitous. Cars are ubiquitous. Cars, we have succeeded in dropping. Guns, we have not. Both are manufactured by large corporations. Both have behind them a clear corporate profit need and profit motive behind them. But in one of them, we have successfully decreased related injuries and fatal consequences, while the other one we have not. And I think there are lessons there 
I think there are lessons there for how we think about firearms and how we think about potentially mitigating the consequences of firearms. Now, all these data, in some respects, are they're fine, but it's hard to wrap one's brain around them, as is the case with most of population health. One of the challenges of population health is that, as everybody here knows, you know, one, one person's death is a tragedy, but a million people die and nobody pays attention. So how is this putting us compared to our peer countries? So maybe this is just what's happening everywhere. Well, it's actually not. It's not what's happening everywhere. So this is homicides by firearm per million people, and this looks only at high-income countries. And what you have down here is the U.S., which where we are 30 times, uh, we are, we're about uh, four times higher than the next closest competitor to us on this metric, which is Switzerland. It's actually interesting and important to note that Switzerland is the next closest competitor, to use that term, because Switzerland has a very strong and robust gun culture. Switzerland has a l deep history of rooted in civilian self-defense, which actually is not incomparable with the American history and culture of civilian self-defense, which frequently is what colors a lot of Second Amendment discussions around guns in this country. But it's important to recognize that our rate of homicide is much higher than in Switzerland and much higher than it is in many other countries. And one last point on the prevalence of the firearm epidemic or the firearm endemic is it may feel like we've been paying a lot of attention to the issue recently, but everybody here knows that we have paid nowhere near as much attention to the firearm epidemic as we have to, say, terrorism in the past 15 years, right? So I've shown you that our gun deaths have stayed stable in the past 16 years. I would ask you all to look back and think about how much attention we have given to terrorism. So it's helpful to say, well, how big an issue is this compared to terrorism? So on the left is U.S. deaths caused by terrorism, and on the right is U.S. deaths uh, I apologize. On the left is U.S. deaths caused by guns. On the right is American deaths caused by terrorism. So you know, this, is, this is really interesting phenomenologically because I would argue that both of these are types of trauma. And as you heard in my bio, biography, I've actually studied both of these. Both of these are events that happen with some regularity. They're both events that inspire fear. They're both events that we know will happen again. It's just a matter of where and when. But the magnitude, it's a hundredfold greater magnitude of deaths by firearms compared to terrorism deaths. And I would like you all to ask yourself, why is that? What are the forces that are driving such attention to this issue versus that issue. And for someone who, like myself, who spent decades studying these phenomena, at least from the health consequence point of view, I think it's really interesting and telling to see the enormous gap in the attention that we've paid to these issues given their disproportionate influence on our daily life. So let's move on to the root cause. So I showed you that the uh, number of firearm deaths in the U.S. is far overwhelmingly higher than any of our peer countries. I note that I'm talking about our peer countries. The U.S., by the way, just to be clear, I don't have a slide on this, doesn't have the highest firearm death rate in the world. There, there, there are many, other, many countries, typically countries in conflict, some in Central America, some in Africa, who have higher firearm death rate than we do, just to be clear on that. I'm comparing us to our peer countries. We can talk about, uh, about global firearms, global trauma, global violence. That's a, in some respects a separate discussion, but I just want to label that. So what's going on? What's the root cause? Well, this is where things start getting a little bit contentious. Because from the perspective, from an epidemiological perspective, there is no question what the root cause is. The root cause is the presence and widespread availability of guns. So 
this is the uh, population of the world on the left. The US is about 4% of the world's, pop world's population. On the right is civilian-owned guns in the world. The US owns about 42% of the civilian-owned guns in the world. So we have a tenfold disproportionate number of civilian-owned guns. We're not talking about military. We're talking about civilian-owned guns. So there is no question that we have a lot more guns than does anybody else. When you compare us to other countries, now we actually can take a broad expanse, forget about comparing us only to high-income countries, and compare ourselves to all countries in the world. This is guns owned by civilians. Uh, we are at uh, higher than, remember I mentioned Switzerland, which has a high, which also has a gun culture similar to the US. But I'll just point out that actually Yemen sneaks in here as a, as a um, uh, higher than Switzerland in terms of guns owned by civilians. But you'll see there's the US and that's Switzerland, right? So we actually have about two and a half times more civilian guns per capita than does Switzerland, which is not a coincidence that we actually have a substantially higher gun-related death rate, with Switzerland being second after us, making reference to the fact that there is a lot of commonalities between these two countries in terms of their culture of guns. When you look at, uh, you can take this and just look at it as a map, you will see this is um, the, uh, essentially it's a density map of uh, guns in the, in the world, and there's the US, oops, that's Yemen right there. So that's, that's us compared to other countries. By the way, the, uh, the, the light color here is, is no data. It's not that it's a, it's a low number. Now, one of the, one of the abiding narratives around guns in this country is that the reason that we need to have so many guns is to protect ourselves from the bad guys. Right? One of the abiding narratives is that, yes, we have lots of guns, but in fact, we would be even safer if we had even more guns. Right? You may remember that after the Orlando Pulse massacre, one of the two leading candidates for presidency of this country said that would have been averted had the security guards and had people inside the nightclub been carrying guns. Not just security guards, people inside the nightclub. Right? So there is this narrative that says, well, you're wrong to say there's a correlation that we are the country with a much higher density of guns than other countries and that that is linked to the burden and the consequences of firearms. Because in fact, the problem is that we don't have enough guns. That had we had more guns, we would be able to shoot the bad guys and therefore we would not get hurt. There is only one problem with that line of argument, which is that it is wrong. Um, something I said clearly. Um, uh, and I could, sh I could spend 45 minutes making that case, but I'm trying to make a little broader case, so I'll just show you one slide. So this is gun ownership versus gun deaths by state. For those of you who are in population health sciences, quantitative or not, this is the kind of slide that one uses to teach students because it's a perfect correlation. Here is gun ownership, here's gun deaths, and it's a straight line, right? There are many, many studies better than this one. I'm just showing this one just to make this point and then to move on from this point. But there is no question that the answer to the question, what is the single thing I should do to minimize being shot by a gun, is don't own a gun. That is counter-narrative. That is counter the broader public narrative about guns being used to protect ourselves. And I, I, I want to be clear that the public narrative is not a fringe narrative. This is a, I don't know if it's a majority narrative, but it's certainly a strong minority or at least half the country narrative that the issue is not that we have more guns. The issue is that we don't have enough guns. 
But that argument is simply not borne out by the data. And I'm trying to here, as I said, give the argument based on the data, leaving aside the political implications of the data, and we can talk about that afterwards. But the data are clear that if you own a gun, you're more likely to be killed by a gun. Okay, point three. So let's talk a little bit about economics, just a couple of uh, slides about economics. So one of the defining features of guns is that they are a product. They are a product. They are manufactured by a particular industry. And that industry has a particular incentive, which is a profit motive. Now, I want to be clear that there are many other products manufactured by many industries. Alcohol is a product manufactured by a particular industry. Tobacco is a product manufactured by a particular industry. Motor vehicles are products manufactured by particular industries. All these industries have the same motive, which is a profit motive. So in no way should this be taken as a sort of an anti-industry statement. I'm simply observing that guns are a product. They're artificial, human-made. If we're living all in nature, there would be no guns. We would you know, fashion uh, you know, little balls out of banana leaves and throw them at each other. I don't know. It's like there are no guns like in nature. It's like a, it's, we make them. We make them and they hurt us. And they are made by corporations that ultimately have more profits if they make more. And we're in this very interesting dynamic because you would think then that, well, bad stuff is happening. And uh, as bad stuff happens, it is going to cut into the bottom line for these corporations. But in fact, that's not true. In fact, as every, this has been shown time and again, every prominent gun-related incident, you see a spike in gun sales and an attendant spike in the number of deaths. Uh, I apologize. In the in the that was a slip. Um, uh, in the stock price of particular industries that manufacture guns. So we're in this interesting cycle, and I'm just observing this. I think it's actually interesting that um, you have to manufacture a product that harms people. You think that we'd say, okay, well, we care about this product for a set of reasons. But we don't really like people being harmed, do we? So the more people get harmed, you're like, Ugh, you start having second doubts about the product. But no, it's not what's happening in this country. What's happening is every time people are harmed, we actually buy more of these products. And I think in no small part, that is because of the narrative that I tried to dispel a few slides ago, that if we had more guns, we could keep harm from happening to us. When in fact, the truth is, if we had more guns, we will have more bad things happening to us. So that's part A about economics. Part B, so how much is this costing us? Well, gun violence costs us about uh, $229 billion annually. And uh, just to sort of put that in uh, perspective, that's roughly the same as uh, the cost of obesity, a little bit more than Apple's total value. Apple is the, most, uh, um, um, is, is the country with the highest valuation in the world. Roughly the same then as Medicaid spending a little bit less than the cost of smoking. So suppose for a second you were a public health professional, a student, a scholar, or a practitioner, right? And suppose for a second you said, one of the things that should motivate me are the factors in our world that are costing us enormous amounts of money, right? Suppose you said that. Would that be an unreasonable position to take? I don't think so. Seems to me reasonable. Seems to me like a reasonable thing to say. We should focus our attention on the things that are hurting people and that are costing us buckets of money, right? What you would do is you'd say, well, we should spend a lot of attention on smoking, obesity. And we do that, right? But how do you skip over guns? I mean, it's right there with them. I'll ask you, to say how much of the conversation within your school of public health has been on obesity, 
and on smoking and how much of it has been on guns in the past, let's say, year. I'll tell you what it's like in my school. In my school, obesity conversation, smoking conversation, gun conversation. That's what it is at the school I run. So maybe you're different, I don't know. But I bet that we are all doing this. All of us, all schools. Not just schools, but also practice that we pay much less attention to this issue than we pay to these other issues that are roughly the same cost. And of course the question is why, and it's a very complicated set of questions in which we can, we can get to afterwards. So I want to be clear, I'm not, I am casting us all in the same boat. I think we are all falling short on discussing this issue anywhere near as much as the burden of its health consequences or its economic consequences. So let me turn to this issue of lethality. So the issue of lethality is a very important issue when one is thinking about guns. Because one of the points that I hear not infrequently is, well, you're just talking about guns, but if you remove guns, there will be other things that hurt people. There are knives and, you know, slingshots and uh, things like that. And um, I get it. I, too, have read the Bible. Um, um, and this becomes more of an issue when one looks carefully about what we are dying from from guns. I'm still talking about death here. So first of all, three-fifths of gun deaths are suicides. This is very important because the issue of lethality becomes critical here about suicide. And this has enormous implications for the entire firearm public conversation. Let me go back to Chicago. Remember I started off, I showed you the, the uh, Wall Street Journal about Chicago? Just to make a point that it's very public in the media, right? And I also made the point that this is Chicago. This is, a, this is really not the issue at a population level. The population level issue, this is the issue. And almost two-thirds of gun-related deaths are suicides. And the question always becomes then, well, you're just talking about guns, but if you take out guns, people will still kill themselves. People will use knives or ropes or jump off buildings. Okay, well, let's explore that for a second. So first of all, this is what's been happening with homicides and suicides related to firearms in this country. Remember, since, since 1999, where the overall has been roughly flat, remember that? Look at this. The homicides have actually been going down, while suicides have been going up, which is why the aggregate is flat. This has implications, of course, for the narrative, which again I keep coming back to because I find it's a narrative that, that gives me some discomfort because of its, of its high deviance from the truth, which is that, well, if we had more guns, we would just kill the bad guys away and they will stop killing us. So number one, most deaths from guns are not because of the bad guys killing us. That's actually going down. Most deaths from guns because we're killing ourselves. So you say, okay, 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 we'll take away guns. We'll still figure out a way to kill ourselves. Well, yes and no. Here's the issue. The issue is the lethality of different methods that are available to us to try to harm ourselves. This is we cut ourselves with a knife, use poison, or use a firearm. If we try to kill ourselves with a gun, we are successful 97% of the time. If we try to kill ourselves with a poison, we're successful 7% of the time. If we try to kill ourselves with a knife, we're successful 5% of the time. Now, for any of you who've ever studied suicide, which is a very difficult, very complicated area, a high proportion of suicide is ultimately driven by a, an unexpected, sudden, and one-time episode of acute suicidality. So we as a country have a choice to say, well, when we have that unanticipated acute, once in a lifetime, by the way, episode of suicidality, I have a gun available to me, which means I can actually then kill myself successfully. Or I have a knife available to me where, you know, I am likely not going to be able to kill myself. I am likely going to have an emergency department where I'm going to be treated. 
and where I'm actually never going to do it again and I am going to live. So the issue is not, well, people still kill themselves some other way. People might still try to kill themselves, but they're not succeeding anywhere near the same proportion. And this underlies the whole issue around firearms, which, as I said before, are a particular product. They are a particular product with high lethality. You hear arguments after, let's go back to the Orlando shooting. Well, he was someone who was filled with hate, and he would have gone into the nightclub and tried to hurt people even if he didn't have guns. Okay, let us accept that. He would have gone in with a knife. He would not have killed 49 people with a knife. So right, this is the issue of lethality that is at the heart of the matter of a product that is manufactured with lethality as its, as its intent. So now, I've so far I've been talking mostly about deaths, and I'm, I'm slowly going to start shading into injury. I'm going to do a bit more on injury, but let me just uh, introduce the topic of injury by way of the discussion on lethality. So this is gun casualties in 2012. This is the most recent data I could find on this. And uh, the top bar is homicide or assault, essentially people doing things to other people. The second bar is suicide. You're doing something to yourself. And the third bar is accident. So here's what I want you to see. Look at suicide. Nearly all suicides are deaths. See how few suicide injuries there are? Conversely, nearly all accidents are actually injuries. But now look at homicides. And this is, as I'm going to get to an injury in a second, the part that somehow keeps slipping off the public conversation. We keep talking about number of people who are killed by guns. We keep talking about number of people killed by guns, which is the red bar. This bar plus that bar, right? And a little bit there, but it's negligible. Remember I said this is three-fifths of the total, and you can actually see it here, right? That is, but you know, you put those two together, that's a three to two ratio, right? But look what you have here. Look at that. So there are about 80,000 people a year in this country who have a bullet go through their body and who don't die. Now, this is not a forum for public disclosure, so I will not ask people to self-disclose, but if any of you have ever had a bullet go through your body, you will know that that is not a good thing. I've never had a bullet go through my body. I have served as an emergency physician, and I have dealt with many people coming to my emergency department who had bullets go through their body. It is a terrible injury, and data that are emerging show that the long-term health consequences, physical health and mental health, of a gun injury are substantially worse than comparable injuries, let's say a motor vehicle injury. If you were to choose, if you were given a Faustian bargain, choose between a gun injury where you live or a motor vehicle injury where you live, you should choose the motor vehicle injury because it, you'll re recover much faster. So the issue of lethality then compounds the question, compounds the issue of injuries and people who are left behind, which I'll get to in a second. But let me show you this last slide on suicides and lethality. So this slide looks at firearm suicides and suicides by other means. Okay? So this is firearm suicides. This is non-firearm suicides, meaning killing yourself with knives and ropes and jumping. And there are two bars. These are the light gray are states with high rates of gun ownership. The dark bars are states with low rates of gun ownership. So I want you to look at a couple of things on this graph. Point A, where you have high gun ownership states, you have fourfold more gun-related suicides. Right? This goes back to my point. More guns, more gun deaths. Point A. Point B. There are also suicides due to other things. 
And those don't vary depending on whether or not states have high or low guns, which sort of makes sense, right? Makes sense. Whether or not state has a lot of guns or not a lot of guns, number of people who are going to use a knife doesn't really matter. But two points to observe. Number one, this rate is less than half of that rate. Number two, if the argument were true that if we took away guns, people would find another way to kill themselves, right? You would expect here that this bar would be disproportionately higher, right? You'd expect there to be a compensatory increase in deaths due to in suicide deaths from other means. But we don't see that. Why is that? It goes back to the point I made about lethality. The point about lethality is this, is that a large proportion of suicides are driven by an acute suicidal ideation event. And the difference between a successful completed suicide and a suicide attempt that passes and where you resume your life is whether you have a lethal means available to you, where you're going to be 96% successful, or another means, where you're going to be 6 percent successful. And this is why, with a lot of guns available, we are much more likely to kill ourselves, while if there aren't guns available, yes, they're still going to have suicide, but we're going to have much less suicide. <coughs> it's just to make sure you're all still awake. <laughs> okay. So now, here is what we often forget. We keep forgetting those who are injured. And I'm using the term people who have a bullet go through their body on purpose. Because the word injury is almost like, it, it, it's almost a, a neutral term. It's almost a sterilized term. Injury means you have a piece of metal go through your body. So the majority of gun injuries are actually injuries. They're non-fatal. So this is from a study that we, we just did. So this is total burden of firearm injury. The same, roughly all the same time period. Everything I'm showing is about since 2000. About 30% are fatal. And the other, roughly 70% are non-fatal. And uh, that's divided into two. About, sort of a, about a third of this group are relatively minor injuries. And those are typically um, injuries to the extremities. Those are typically um, uh, gunshots to hands, feet, things like that. While another two-thirds are actually hospitalized. And that's the group that carries the burden of injury. What's been happening in the past 10 years, 15 years, that has gone unnoticed, is that while the firearm death rate has stayed stable, right, I've showed you that since 99, the injury rate has increased. So this is uh, firearm injuries. This is fatal, stayed roughly the same, non-fatal going up since 2001. So I started off by saying, look, this hasn't changed in the past 16, 17 years. It's not true it hasn't changed. It's true that the deaths have not changed. But overlaid on that, there have been more and more injuries. Why have injuries been increasing? Well. First of all, there have to be more shootings for injuries to increase. Secondly is we have gotten better at keeping people alive after they get shot. So another way to think about this is had we not gotten better at keeping people alive with bad things happening, bad piece of metal going through their body, our homicide rate, our, our death rate, I apologize, not homicide, our death rate overall, would have gone up. But instead, that stayed roughly stable and what we're seeing going up is the injury rate. So number of people who are shot who do not die. And this, uh, this is from a, a paper that will be coming out in the American Journal of Epidemiology soon. And the way to read this is, this is the changes in homicide, suicide, and accidental injuries due to guns. So all I want you to look at is, so this is homicide, this is suicide, this is accidental. Let me just dispense with accidental just for a second. The accidental is going, has actually been going down in this time interval I'm talking about in the past 15 years. But let me put that aside for a second. So look at this. The 
assault intent, the homicide attempt, has been going up. But the increase is not in fatal. See, the fatal, in fact, is actually a slight decrease. The increase is in the non-fatal. Suicide, though, look at suicide. See how suicide is going up and that's driven by fatal? Right? Because suicide, it's actually a simple matter. It's much easier to kill yourself with a gun than to kill someone else. It's actually that simple. So there are more shootings happening. And as a result, that increase is manifesting in more fatal suicides and more non-fatal homicides as we get better at keeping people alive who are shot. So about 32,000, 33,000 people a year are die from firearms. Another 80 to 90,000 are injured by guns. And I wave my hand when I say 80 to 90,000 for a very simple reason, that we actually don't know exactly how many. Why don't we know how many? Because we have no registry of injuries from firearms. Why don't we have a registry of injuries from firearms? Because we don't invest in such a registry. So these are questions that we don't know, and we obviously can get at them through different ways. So, sixth point. I want to talk a little bit about the mental health myth. So what happens, what is the, the media narrative after Orlando? after Bernardino, after Newtown. Right, the media narrative is that the shooter had mental illness. What is then the almost de rigueur political response? We should do more to deal with people with mental illness and make sure people with mental illness do not have access to guns. In fact, this is, a, this is a really telling poll, which I find somewhat disturbing. Um, um, are mass shootings a sign of mental health or gun law failures? Do you think, the question is, do you think that mass shootings in this country are more a reflection of problems identifying treatment with mental health problems or inadequate gun, inadequate gun control laws? 63% of people say mass shootings are a sign of mental health problems, not of gun control laws. 23% say it's a problem of gun control laws. So the data, incontrovertibly, are as follows. Number one, it is true that people with mental illness are more likely to be violent than people without mental illness. Number two, it is also true that people with mental illness are far, by far, I mean four times more likely to be the victims of violence than to be the perpetrators of violence. Number three, if people with mental illness are going to use a gun, they are far more likely to kill themselves than to hurt somebody else. Number four, if we invested all our beanies on this issue in uh, being 100% certain that somebody with mental illness doesn't have a gun, we would make no dent on the firearm death or injury rate at the population level in this country. But of course, that's not what we do. We have invested substantially in this country in checks on mental illness. And uh, this is the National Incident Check System, which in 2007, mental health records account for about 70% of federal disqualifying. By 2013, about 28% of disqualifications from gun purchase were because of mental illness, going up from about 300,000 to 3.2 million. That's a tenfold increase. Now, you say, Okay, but you're just saying that. So, mental health must be bad. It must be bad for guns. It feels intuitively like mental illness is a bad thing for guns. So, how do we solve this? Well, we have the good fortune in this country of being next door to a natural experiment. The natural experiment is called Canada. You're very close to Canada here. You know, it's like the old joke. Dad, what's a Canadian? Well, son, a Canadian is just like an American with no guns and with health insurance. That's Canada. <laughs> so are Canadians 
less troubled by mental illness than Americans? Well, not really. This is lifetime problems, psychiatric disorders in Canada and the U.S., well within the margin of error, and any anxiety disorder, major depression, bipolar disorder, this UNS, and that's Canada. So mental illness is not that different in Canada and the U.S. This is firearm homicide rate in Canada versus the U.S. So the problem is not mental illness. Our attention on mental illness is a red herring. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot we need to be doing better on mental illness. I've spent my academic career studying the epidemiology of psychiatric disorders. We are, we are woefully underserving the needs of people in this country with mental illness. That's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that the narrative that says mental illness is the cause of the firearm epidemic is simply wrong. And it pains me as every time there's a mass shooting, a reporter will call and she or he will say, what do you think about we should do about mental illness? And I say, well, mental illness is not the problem. The problem is the number of guns we have available. And she'll say, no, 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 no. But what I really want to know is what should we do to keep people from mental illness, uh, with mental illness from having guns? To which I say, well, really what we should do is just have fewer guns so fewer people get guns in general. Uh, but our national narrative is so far away from this as to be painful to observe. So let me now just uh, conclude by moving to sort of potential solutions. And uh, so there is an emerging body of literature, despite the fact that there has been such a challenge in funding this work, that is emerging um, uh, that is looking at the ways in which mostly state-level activity can mitigate the firearm epidemic. Um, there has been a rise in firearm background checks. As this graph shows, you can see the firearm background checks um, rising and falling depending on sort of mass shootings. We're very inconsistent about it. Even though the best available evidence suggests that firearm background checks, bullet purchase background checks, as well as devices like ballistic fingerprinting and smart guns can substantially reduce the burden of firearms, of the burden of firearms, and that will work. We're very inconsistent in applying these. And in fact, we apply them typically at the state level because we've had inaction at the federal level on this issue, leaving a real patchwork system. Ah, you say. Okay, but yes, we can do all these things, we can create laws, but we all know that bad guys can still get guns and they can still come and kill us in our sleep unless we have guns to shoot them off, right? So leaving aside the fact that um, most of the time gun deaths are because we're killing ourselves, not because we're killing other people, leaving that aside, is it true that it's bad guys who obtain guns illegally? It's not true, actually. These are all just looking at mass shootings, but roughly reflects other things. Um, most of the time, killers do obtain weapons legally. It's about the availability and the widespread and easy availability of guns. There is an emerging literature that is now looking at firearm injury as correlated with the laws that are put in states to limit firearm injury. This is an area, it's a very interesting scientific area now. It's an area of some scientific contention. We've published a series of papers from our group on this, some of which have been very controversial, because for the simple reason that the assessment of the effectiveness of state-level legislation is actually very difficult. And it's very difficult to, to, to ascribe reduction in firearm injury to single, particular, isolated firearm legislation. Having said that, there is broad consensus that the way to read this map is the shaded lines are states which have at least one firearm law in place. The darker the color is uh, more deaths due to injury. And what you see is that the states that are shaded, by and large, have lower 
injury rates from firearms than states that are not shaded. One of the biggest challenges around thinking about what works and thinking about legislation that works, that can work to mitigate the firearm epidemic, is the role of culture in promoting, supporting, and certainly complicating the public discussion about guns in this country. And the challenge around the role of culture is the extent to which the role of culture is informed by and influenced by, or conversely informs and influence, influences legislation. This is from a study that we did recently where uh, we looked at elements of social gun culture. And what we looked at are, we have sort of asked people questions around the extent to which guns are a part of their culture, their interactions with family and friends. And uh, you see sort of this percent of people nationally for whose social life with friends involves guns, social life with family involves guns, family um, thinks less of gun non-ownership, and uh, social circle thinks less of gun non-ownership. You have about, overall, about 10% of people who are, for whom guns are a defining part of their social identity. Um, uh, social gun culture is associated by about two point, uh, it's more than twofold associated with ownership of guns, which is in many respects not surprising. And what is surprising is that we have so little science about understanding the role of gun and gun culture in shaping gun ownership and in shaping our, um, the consequences of guns. So as far as I'm concerned from a solution space point of view on the issue of firearms, we have to have solutions that are at the intersection of culture around guns and legislation around guns. And to say that we are going to solve this and mitigate these consequences by tackling one without the other, I think is a misread of the literature. I will point out that an enormously complicating factor is the fact that guns are a product manufactured by an industry, and that industry is a non-neutral party in any legislative discussion and any cultural discussion. So we as populations, I think, have a responsibility that we should hold ourselves to, to make sure that the voices of an industry that has a clear profit motive are not disproportionately outweighing the voices of a population that is concerned with a public good, that public good being our health. And I am not for a second discounting the importance of having multiple voices, public and private, population and industry. I think all of those voices have a space and all of those voices should be heard. I am simply saying that none of these voices should be disproportionately drowning out other voices. And I am not sure that that's not what's happening right now. One of the narratives that is out there in the public is that you can change, you can change the firearm epidemic and its consequences through simple legislative moves or, or, or unitary legislative moves like Australia did. Right? You've all heard about that. Australia did things, gun injury went down dramatically. Well, it's complicated. It's actually not so simple because this is rate of firearm suicides after Australia's gun buyback program. So this was what their suicide was, firearm suicide, you see. It was actually, this is the gun buyback program. It was already going down quite a bit. There was a, a, sh a steepening of the slope after the gun buyback program. But in fact, suicide rates were going down quite a bit before um, the gun buyback program in Australia. So I have come to feel like the, there is here a complex and reciprocal interaction between culture and legislation. Cultural shifts drive legislative shifts. Legislative shifts drive cultural shifts. And I've also come to feel like the conversation has to shift away from a 
an us versus them conversation to a conversation where you have a public and private sector both choosing to work towards a public good, which is the health of populations. So where are we at as a population in terms of culture? A couple of slides to conclude. This is two years after Newtown. This is from a, pop, uh, from a survey that looked at what's more important, control gun ownership or protect the right of Americans to own guns. After Newtown, protecting the right of Americans to, go on, to own guns has increased, and it's now a more common opinion than is the importance of controlling gun ownership. This goes back to this paradoxical effect that I noted before, that after Newtown, after Orlando, there's an increase in gun sales, as we all try to get guns to keep the bad guys from killing us. But what's interesting about this is that from a public opinion on this issue, when we talk about do you care about gun control, do you want gun control, the answer is generally no. But we, as a population, are smarter than that. When people are asked, are you supportive of background checks for private and gun show sales? Are you supportive for, this is a mental illness question, federal database to track gun sales, um, more security guards, banning on semi-automatic semi weapons, ban on assault-style assault weapons, ban on high-capacity ammunition clips, ban on online sale of ammunition, we are in favor of all of them. I would give us a B- minus on this. I actually think that there are some of the things that uh, we are actually in favor of that we shouldn't be in favor of, but at least we are against um, giving teachers guns. I don't know who you were trained by, but uh, I did not want my teachers to have guns when I was growing up. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just going to conclude. Two last slides. So remember I mentioned that firearms are... Um, we now have more people die from firearms than we have from uh, motor vehicles. I made the point that there's a lot of commonality between firearms and motor vehicles, that they're both consumer products. They're both manufactured by corporations who have an interest in uh, generating profit. And one, we've been able to fix its lethality. The other one, we really have not. I think actually motor vehicles present a really interesting case study. The blue line here is the, over the past century, number of deaths from motor vehicles gone down 15-fold over the past century. What is amazing about the story is that number of vehicle miles driven has gone down 15-fold. So we've actually decreased by 225-fold the lethality per vehicle mile driven, 15 times 15. So we have not stopped gun manufacturers, uh, sorry, car manufacturers from selling cars, still selling cars. We have not stopped from driving cars. The American dream of the car and the open road that hasn't been touched. We can talk about whether that's a good idea or not in a separate discussion, but be that as it may, we haven't done that. What we've done is we have mitigated the consequences of, let's use the term, the motor vehicle epidemic. How have we done that? Well, we've done that through seat belts, through airbags, through drunk driving legislation, through stricter, more careful, more thoughtful enforcement, which shows that it actually can be done. And it can be done in a way that preserves the cultural positioning of a particular product, but also saves the health of populations. This is um, my last slide. This is my pet goldfish. I have a soft spot in my heart for my pet goldfish. And I would like it to be healthy. So what do I do? Well, I tell my goldfish, I say, make sure you swim around your goldfish bowl 10 times clockwise, 10 times counterclockwise every day. I say, when I give you little flaky bits of food on top of the surface of your goldfish bowl, don't eat too much so you don't get fat. And if you have a goldfish companion, make sure you have safe goldfish sex, right? All <laughs> and you know, I say to my goldfish, if you have any lethal weapons at your disposal, don't shoot anybody or yourself. Now you're all laughing, but that's what we do all the time. This is what we do to try to promote health. But in fact, we all are chuckling because we know that that's sort of nonsense. That if we, I want my goldfish to be healthy, the thing I need to do is change its water. If I don't change its water, 
It doesn't matter how many laps it swims, how much it eats or doesn't eat, how careful it is with lethal, with its uh, lethal uh, weapons, lethal products, because the goldfish is not going to be healthy. At the end of the day, the issue of guns as an epidemic in this country is an issue that is pervades our social, cultural, economic, political space. It is a quintessential population health issue. It is an issue that can be solved, can be mitigated, if we tackle these underlying social, economic, cultural factors that are resulting in about 33,000 people dying every year, about 90,000 people being injured every year, and other hundreds of thousands and millions of people who are suffering the as yet unmeasured physical and mental health consequences of firearms, both homicide and suicide and accidental in this country. I'll stop there. Thank you for having me. I just want to thank, thank Sandra for what was just a fascinating and illuminating talk on this topic area. And it is a topic that, as a school of public health, we have not had much attention to. And I hope this opens people's eyes and, and has a broader discussion in our school and across the country. Um, we are... We are very close to uh, finishing, so I think we could entertain just one question from Dr. Galea at this point. Uh, who would like to ask their question? <laughs> so we have someone here, and could you speak up? And Sandra, could you yeah. repeat the question? Absolutely. That um, Switzerland and Uruguay made the list of countries with the with the highest ownership of guns. When the Global uh, Peace Index this year indicates that these two countries are also two of the only ten countries that are free of conflict, I was wondering if you have any thoughts or comments about that. I think it's a reflection of. Um, I mean, they're, they're free of of mass conflict, which which sways a lot of the peace index. But they're countries with a strong gun culture, and uh, just like the U.S. has a strong gun culture. And the reason um, I actually pointed out Switzerland is th there are many lessons to be learned from Switzerland. One of the biggest uh, legislative levers that are used in Switzerland that we have not are background checks for ammunition purchase, and, uh, which is something actually which is on the ballot in California right now. And uh, it's only beginning to see light of day in this country. So Switzerland has maintained a gun culture, a respected a culture, strong culture of uh, civilian self-defense, um, while having one-third fewer adverse consequences of guns than we have. And uh, these are not countries in florid conflict. They are countries like ours uh, with a, where guns are a strong part of their cultural identity and with far fewer consequences of guns than we have. I'll stop there. Okay. So d I would like, to, uh, Dr. Galeo has put up his Twitter account and his email, but I would like to draw attention to the fact that he has a weekly dean's note from Boston University School of Public Health where he puts out uh, a weekly kind of topic area. I've been following him for over a year, and it's very interesting. So any of our listserv. Um, Sandro, and uh, is appreciation from our school, I'd like to present you, if you could come back up. Um, <laughs> so two gifts, uh, one financial and one uh, a plaque. <laughs> but I uh, wanted to just thank you. And again, it was one of the most provocative talks I think we've had. So thank you. Very much. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to take uh, just a few minutes to um, present an award that we do at this lecture annually, which is, as school tradition, uh, the Perry Lecture is, we, is the, the lecture where we hand out the Teacher of the Year Award. And the Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award is presented to a faculty member whose recent teaching performance, teaching initiatives, publications, and or presentations demo 
demonstrate outstanding contributions to education within the School of Public Health and Health Professions. It's my great, great pleasure to present the 2016 Teacher of the Year Award to Dr. Dietrich Kuhlman. <laughs> Dietrich, can you So I'll wait for you to come down here. Congratulations. So Dietrich came to the University of Buffalo in 2005 as an adjunct professor, and he joined our faculty full-time in 2014. He leads several, several of our most highly enrolled biostatistical courses, and he consistently teaches about 1,600 students per year in the classes that he offers in our program. <laughs> Dietrich's teaching has been rated consistently excellent by his students, receiving outstanding scores on instructor evaluation. Recent student evaluations about his teaching include the following comments. Love, love, love this <laughs> class. Second, Dr. Kuhlman is possibly the best professor in the university. He truly loves the material. <laughs> Dietrich goes well beyond a uh, normal instructor. He regularly offers sessions on the weekend for struggling students to come in to help them understand material and help them to succeed. He's also an engaged mentor and often counsels undergraduate and promising students to consider joining our graduate programs. He volunteers time to assist students with taking, uh, taking a series of actuarial exams, not just for our biostatistics students, but also students in the math department. In addition to classroom teaching, he's the director of our undergraduate statistics program at UB, and as the director, he developed our undergraduate minor and put substantial efforts towards reinstating our undergraduate BA degree in statistics. When our school began offering the minor, we just had a few students enrolled in the core sequence. Through Dietrich's reputation as an outstanding teacher and engaging practice in the classroom, we now have about 175 students enrolled in our statistics minor. Dr. Kuhlman is an outstanding teacher and mentor. His passion for teaching and mentoring is evident in all that interact with him. His nominator described him as having, quote, extensive passion for the subject matter and a genius talent for instruction. I wholeheartedly agree. It's been such a pleasure to work with you, and congratulations on Teacher of the Year. I would like to um, tell everyone this has been live streamed. It will be available to re-watch for those of you that would like to do this. I also would like to take a minute to thank those that helped to put this together. Uh, Lorraine Collins, our Associate Dean for Research, who helps to run the Perry Lecture, and she and uh, Barb Hudzik, a uh, member of our staff who also helped to do this, and also Veronica Myers. So thank you again, and we'll see you in one year. <laughs>